before, I'll say it again, nothing like a Negro spiritual to capture the depth of human emotion, but also the profound hope that is in God. I also, uh, this was reflecting as Patty was playing that um, this was very fitting for our theme and, and the subject we're working on uh, right now, Psalm 77, and this whole challenge of human distress. Uh, what do we do with the distress that comes into our lives? How do we face it? How do we handle it? How, how do we cope? Uh, we find this theme not just in Psalm 77. This morning, uh, Lori read for us uh, from Psalms 131, where it paints that picture of a weaned child leaning against the parent for, for refuge and for help. No longer an infant, grown up, standing more on one's own, but that place of refuge. And, and the whole goal here is this idea of repose. What does it mean in the face of the distress that comes into our lives? And we all know it. We've all tasted that experience. We all know those difficult feelings. What does it mean to be able in those times and places to find a repose in God that may not make the hard go away, but that settles and calms the soul so that instead of going off the rails in some way, attempting to cope, attempting to survive, we're able to wait on the Lord, to look to Him calmly with trust and find hope and healing. This is the theme we're working on, and it's an absolutely vital theme simply because Distress is so often a part of our lives. I want to just uh, review briefly here uh, a couple of things that we've seen in past weeks. Is, is this up now? Did, is Ken, uh, Ken said he, he didn't see my PowerPoint. Is it up? Oh yeah, there it is, the title slide. So. We talked before about God's template for suffering, and I just wanted to briefly review that as, as we move back into Psalm 77 this morning. You see there in the first uh, blue uh, block there, we have the heading, Distress Enters the Life. Could be for a lot of reasons, a lot of different uh, problems that we face. And, but then we saw, as we looked at Psalm 77 in past weeks, we saw that the psalmist response to this trouble that had come into his life, his response was that a resolve, a certain determination was established in his heart. Do you remember what that was? I will seek God. I will take this trouble to God. I won't try to handle it on my own. I won't simply fret and worry. I am going to God. And, and he talks, he, he exhorts himself. We saw how in the psalm, the Hebrew uh, used a verb form over and over again. It was one of self-exhortation. Go to God. Don't give up. Keep seeking Him. Even though He seems not to answer, don't, don't turn away. Keep knocking. Keep seeking. Keep asking. That was the picture we saw there. But then we noted, this is kind of a pattern of the whole psalm, we noted that He then faces and experiences at one point in His in his uh, seeking of the Lord, he faces and experiences doubt. How do I know God will answer me? How do I know God will care? How do I know that he's even paying attention to me? We feel those things at times, don't we? 
as we wrestle with the problems that confront us and, and it feels like the problems are the only thing present. And so we, we see the psalmist there wrestling with doubt. That's in verses uh, 7 through 9. Will the Lord reject forever? Will He never be favorable again? Has His loving kindness ceased? We face these kinds of questions, but then we saw that the final, the, the, the place that He's moving as He's determined to seek God in His trouble, the place that He is moving is this place of repose. And we talked about that in past weeks. A calm, confiding, restful trust that even in the face of great difficulty, the confidence has been gained that the one who puts his trust in God will never know shame of face. Never let down. Never abandoned. Never pushed off to the side. No, the repose that God is faithful. This is, this is the goal that, that we're seeking to, to, to move towards. This is the secret of successfully facing the distress that comes into all of our lives at one point or another. We want to know how to find this place of repose. Now I want to be clear before we move on and back into the psalm. This attainment of repose, it's not merely a matter of human willpower. We're not talking about uh, even something like cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT is, is a big deal these days where you talk to yourself and you remind yourself of what healthy thinking is and, and so forth and so on. Uh, maybe what we end up doing parallels that in a bit, but, but this is not just a human thing that we do this movement through distress to the place of repose. Not just a human accomplishment. This is something that the Holy Spirit will work in your heart as you look to Him in your distress. It's a gift of God. It's something He brings to you. And, and he, he seeks to stir up in your heart that resolve, I'm going to seek God in my trouble. But as He stirs that up in your heart, He answers that, that movement that He has begun in you. He answers it by creating in you this gift of repose. What I'm trying to say is this is not something you have to feel, oh, somehow I have to pull this off. Somehow I have to accomplish this in the midst of my distress and difficult emotions and tendency to depression in the face of trouble and, and all of these things that come at us. It's not that you have to pull something off. It's that He wants to do something for you when you're in that place. He wants to work with you and in you to bring you to that calm and settled trust, the weaned child leaning against the refuge of a strong and able parent. And so this is a miracle of God in the life, this movement. It's a gift from God. But then mind you, that doesn't always mean that the process of getting there, the process of arriving at repose, it doesn't mean that it's always easy. It can be challenging. It can be difficult. Whenever difficult emotions come on board, it's hard for us, isn't it, to wade through them. There's something about distress that dulls the heart and blinds the eyes. What seems so clear before? You think of the day when when you're on the mountaintop spiritually and, and you see God clearly and every, your heart is filled with joy and strength and, and everything seems so clear and, and you, you say, how could I ever doubt Him? He is so good. He is so present. He's helping me in so many ways. What a glorious God. 
You think of those times, and how could I ever doubt? And yet, when trouble comes, we can find ourselves pulled down into the depths where it becomes very difficult to see how good God is and how faithful He will be. So here's the vital question. We're going to wrestle with this today. How do you come off the victor spiritually when you find yourself in such a place? How do you come off the victor? How do you arrive at the place of repose instead of being driven down into the depths of discouragement and despair and running off somewhere else to try to find relief? How do we, how do, we do this? To answer that question, we want to pay closer attention to verse 10. Now I know that... Uh, see if I can get that to move. Maybe I have to hold my tongue right. There we go. We want to pay closer attention to verse 10. And once again, I mentioned this in past weeks, there's quite a variety of translations of this verse. And I don't want to go into all the detail of why I have settled down upon the King James Version as the one that most accurately translates the Hebrew from this passage. But there it is. Uh, your version may be different. My own version is different. But I think this is the most accurate translation. And, and here's how it reads. Verse 10, And I said, This is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Now you'll notice immediately that there are two parts to this verse. And I've marked it there in what I've put on the screen. There's first of all a statement, this is my infirmity. And then following that statement, there's an assertion. It's connected to the earlier part of the psalm where he forms his resolve to seek God. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an extension of that resolve. It's a further development of that resolve. He says, after he says, this is my infirmity, he says, but I will seek, or I, sorry, I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. So we begin with this statement, this is my infirmity. Well, what does he mean by this? And to what is he referring? The first thing I want you to notice is that when he says, this is my infirmity, he's making a confession. He's making a confession. He's telling us something about himself. You know, what is it that he's telling us? The word infirmity we don't use so much anymore. Uh, easier word, one that we're more familiar with, is the word weakness. Weakness, or we might even imply the idea of failing. This is a failing I have. This is a, a weakness I have. And, and so he's telling us that he has a weakness. Here in the middle of his battle with distress and his resolve to seek God, he says, I have a weakness. There's, there's, there's a part of me that's weak, a place in me that is not strong. He's confessing that to us. He's telling us that, that there's a part of him that when tested is liable to give way. Yeah, my mind goes to... Uh, a welding project I did once. I, I took welding in high school, and uh, we used the MIG welders. They're they're quite a bit easier to weld than than with an arc welder. Um, and we we built a trailer in high school, and and you know learned to do some really nice welds. Well, years later, I was working as a finished carpenter, and I decided I needed a a lumber rack for my truck. So I rented a welder, but I don't know if, if it was slightly different than the one we'd used in high school, et cetera, et cetera, and I really struggled. I borrowed, I, a friend let me use his garage, and, and it was winter and cold, and I got in there and I welded up my rack for the truck, and, and I put it on the truck, but later I ran into a guy who was a real welder, and we looked at some of the welds, and he said, oh, we could strengthen this here or there. 
You know, you, you weld things up, but if you're not really good at it, there's, there's places that are liable under real stress and pressure to break or give way. And this psalmist here is telling us, I've got weakness in me that when the fire gets really hot, it's liable to break and give way. He understands this about himself. He sees this about himself. And you know, that's really important. It's really important for us to know where our weaknesses lie. Half the battle in the spiritual life is to know the places where you are weak. To know the places where when certain circumstances arise or certain challenges come in, you know ahead of time that's going to be a hard place for me. And then to have the humility to confess I have a weakness here. That's what the psalmist is doing as he tells us, this is my infirmity. We could put it in more modern English, this is the place of my weakness. But then what is that weakness he speaks of? What is the weakness that he confesses, the weakness that he's, that he's telling us about here? Now to answer that question, we must pay attention to the verses that, that go before. So in, in this verses from verses 7 through 9, I referred to it a bit ago, he's, he asks a series of questions. Let's read it again now. Will the Lord reject forever? Will He never be favorable again? Has His loving kindness ceased forever? Has His promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or has He in anger withdrawn his compassion? Do you see there, there's this whole series of questions. And they've come to him, they've, they've forcibly pushed themselves upon him as he wrestles with his distress. But the thing that I want you to note is that the questions are expressive generally of doubt and fear. Do you see that there? The hard things come into the life, the problems upon him, and, and the difficult emotions that come with, with difficult experiences. And in the midst of all that, what comes up is, 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 is there's doubt and there's fear. Maybe God won't show up for me. Maybe God's forgotten his promise. Oh, what happens if, if I'm alone in this trouble? You see, the, these are the kinds of things that, that come up in his mind. And in his confession, what, is, what he is saying, what he is telling us, is that in his distress, in his experience of distress, he tends to forget certain things about God. Does anybody here relate to that? Have you ever had that experience? Or when the distress is heavy upon you, the trouble burdening your heart, it's really easy to start to forget certain vital truths about God. And that's what he's telling us. He's telling us that his weakness is this inability in the face of great trouble to hold on to the truth about God. It slips out of his hands. It, it, it seems to recede from him. It, it, it's no longer clear in the mind. And so as he forgets, it leads to doubts and fears, and the doubts and fears threaten to overwhelm him. Now mind you, the great danger here which I think all of us, as, as we reflect on our own experiences, the great danger here is that the doubts and the fears begin to feel like the thing which is most real. 
You get that? I, I want to say that again. The doubts and the fears begin to feel like the thing that is most real. I forgot a slide here kind of capsulates or encompasses, summarizes what I've just tried to say. What are we to believe when we're in those places of, of trouble and, and great distress? What are we to believe? Our doubts and our fears? Or the faithfulness of God? But you see, the danger is, is that in the face of those troubles, that the doubts and fears begin to feel most real. God doesn't seem real anymore. And as the doubts and fears assault the soul, they seem more and more certain to be true. The great truths about God less and less to be true. It's a terrible place to be in. But all the great saints have known it. You read through the Scripture. You read the stories. You read the experiences of men of God and women of God all down through the ages. And they face this same challenge. It's not just unique to, to me or to you. It's common to God's people all the way through. But it's a difficult place to be in. But again, we read the stories, Jacob and Job and David and even the Christ Himself. They all knew this particular battle. But of course, then again, the great thing that we want to know is how are we to come out from such a place where God seems less and less true, the doubts and fears more and more real? How do we come out from such a place? And it is here that His confession helps us. It is here that we find the answer, the key to facing our distress and being able to successfully move to the place of repose. And it's in this confession. Notice that when he says, when he says, this is my infirmity, he is placing a question mark over everything he's feeling and the doubts and fears that are coming in with them. Do you see that there? It's vital to see that a question mark has now been placed. Instead of the doubts and fears being the thing which is most real, he says, no, the doubts and fears are actually only here because I am weak, because I'm human because I've been touched by this sin problem. In other words, what he's saying is, if I didn't have this weakness, a doubt and fear would never come upon my radar, no matter how difficult the distress might be. Do you see that? It's the weakness of the human heart that brings the doubts and the fears into the picture. And it's not that we are to be uh, ashamed of that weakness, as it were. It's part and parcel of who we are in this world. But to confess the weakness, to confess that I am wrestling with doubts and fears, not because God is not faithful, but because I am weak, oh, that changes the whole picture. I, I like this picture. Uh, I, I found it on, on the web PowerPoint. You can do this little thing and they'll bring up design suggestions. And, and I saw this picture and I said, oh, it's perfect. Do you see all the little men falling over like dominoes, being influenced by the doubts and the fears? But then the confession is made and it becomes a bulwark that stops the whole process. Wait a minute. I'm only doubting and fearing because of my weakness. And that opens a door to turn in a new direction. You see, when, when, the weak, when, when, when the trouble is assaulting us, the doubts and fears are seeming more and more true. To make this confession, it relabels the doubts and fears. It, it puts a new label upon them. They're a part of my weakness. 
Not a part of what is true and healthy and strong and vigorous. No, they're a part of my weakness. It's a very human weakness. But let me call it what it is. And it is this movement, this shift, that allows us to begin to refocus again on God. And so then it's in the next phrase that we see this resolve to refocus. Having made confession, which breaks the power of the doubts and fears assaulting him, he's now able to turn and say, I will remember. I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Do you see what he's doing? No longer the doubts and fears dominating his heart and mind. He's been able to turn, and now his focus is back upon God. And in the next verses, listen to what he says. Verse 11, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made your strength known among the peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Is there a problem that you have faced or is there any problem that you could ever face that God has not promised to redeem you from? Can you find one? Can you find any challenge, any problem, any distress, any difficulty that God has not pledged Himself, I will bring you out of that into a place of great good? Can you find such a problem? Search for it. Look for it. Don't even look in your own life alone. Look in the lives of others. Oh, it's not an easy question, isn't it? You can go with Job and you can read the stories of Job and the great agony of soul as he looks for God's answer to the problems that he is facing. It's not an easy path. Oh, but if you search, if you search hard, you come to this realization that there's not a problem I can have that He has not provided redemption from. Even death itself. Is death a problem that He has forgotten? That He has not been able to meet? That He has no answer for? No, even death itself. He has met this last of problems and He conquered it. He conquered it. What does the New Testament tell us? That as Christians, we need not be afraid of death because it doesn't have the last word. The redeeming God stands athwart the whole of human history and He tells us, Oh, my people, be of good courage. There's nothing that can come into your life that I have not provided answers for. What a privilege to be a Christian. What a privilege to know these things. That we have answers. That we can have peace. Does it take the problems away? Does it mean there's no battle and no struggle anymore? That, that uh, life is row, row, row your boat merrily down the stream? No, it doesn't mean that. Sometimes Christians know even more problems than the unbelievers. You read Psalm 73, the same psalmist. He, he wrestles with that. But it does mean that the Christian has found insight about the God who made him and redeemed him and loves him. The Christian has found insight that gives calm and courage in the face of anything that can come to us. You see, this confession begins to set things right and to put them back in the right perspective. The doubts and the fears are relabeled. 
They are now correctly seen as weakness, and this robs them of their power. And then we're able to move back to consider, I think, do I have another slide here? There we go. Perspective shift. Our perspective can shift back to, to where it should be. Before we remember, before we make confession, circumstances are in our viewfinder. And when we only see circumstances, when we only see the problems that are in front of us, doubts and fears take over and we become preoccupied with our own inner world, with our feelings, with the, with the distress that we're experiencing. Oh, but when we make confession and we're able to, to shift and focus back on God, God comes into the viewfinder. His strength, His promise, His faithfulness, these things begin to preoccupy the mind. And this brings about a fundamental change in our experience of trouble and difficulty. It brings about a change that is a, it's an, it makes a night and day difference. Circumstance not may change. Difficulty may still be there. But something has changed in the soul and there's strength and there's courage, there's peace, and there's an eternal hope. It's a simple act, a very simple act. It's a faith act, this shift and this turn. And it's a fundamental key to success in living the Christian life. I want to end by, and I, I, I put this in my notes, and I thought, have I told that story already? I'm not that old, but I guess I'm getting towards the age where you start telling stories over again. But um, I just want to end with this. It's my own personal testimony on these very things I've been trying to say. I, uh, I'm probably very unusual in this respect. Uh, none of you will be able to relate. But uh, there's a certain place in my life, a certain set of challenges and difficulties that I had over the years formed what I call an emotional cul-de-sac. You know what a cul-de-sac is? That's that fancy French word for where you come into, you know, we use it for suburban housing where there's a road that doesn't go through. It comes, you know, it, it ends and there's a r row of houses kind of circled around that cul-de-sac. Well, if you go into a cul-de-sac, the only way out is the way you came. But uh, if you don't, if you don't want to go from go back the way you came, you kind of get stuck in there. And so over the years, I had this emotional cul-de-sac where if I would drive into that little circle, my emotions start turning around, taking me down. I get more and more distressed and feel almost frantic at times. These emotions are not fun, and I don't know how to get away from them. You know, and, and the thing is, when, when you only see from your human perspective, you see certain elements in your experience, or there's certain thoughts in the mind, and, and, and they keep you there. And so I had wrestled with this emotional cul-de-sac for, for decades. Not that I was stuck there all the time, but often enough I'd find myself back in that circle and not a fun experience. And, and my heart had become more and more weary when I'd find myself there. And I'd come to the place of almost despair. Lord, I don't like this, but I don't know how to to find the road to anywhere else. And I was in this mindset one day, experiencing these difficult emotions, and I came in from my wood shop and I laid down on the bed. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said to me, you know, I'm asking this question, God, what do I do? You haven't seemed to help. You hear the doubts and fears? You're not showing up. You're not helping me here. I don't think you care about me here. All of that can easily play in the mind. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said to me as I asked, what can I do? He said, you can worship. You can worship. 
What? It, 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 it just caught me off guard. I said, what? Worship? But God, that's not fixing the problem. That's not, you know, you're not giving me answers for my problem. No, no. You can worship. Do you see that's the very thing that the psalmist in Psalm 77 is pointing out to us? Take your eyes off the problems. Take your eyes off the things that distress. Oh, but you say, if I take my eyes off of them, who's going to solve them? Who's going to work them out? They're, they're threatening to crush me. Who, who's going to take care of me? Take your eyes off the problems. Put your eyes on God. Worship Him. Begin to think about who He is. Think about His faithfulness. Think about the evidences all through the Scripture of His deep and profound love for you. Think of His promises. I will never leave you or forsake you. Think of what He said in the Gospels. Anyone who believes in Me, even though He die, He shall yet live again. What a God we have. Oh, it makes me sad when I look back across uh, the, the years of my life and realize how many times I just got all mired down in my personal problems and forgot to look at Him. But as He spoke that to me that day, He said, you can worship he helped me to do just that. And a peace came into my soul. I found the rest I was so hungry for. Now, that doesn't mean I've not been challenged again. It comes back. This, you, you keep up a pattern long enough in your life, it takes a while to shake it loose. But the answer, worship. Look back on Him. Turn your eyes on Him. Preoccupy yourself with Him and not your troubles. Stand still. As the, the verse Patty quoted, stand still and the Lord will fight for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, We see these lessons and all of a sudden they seem so simple. How could we have missed them? And yet we know that the evil one does everything he can to mire us down in doubts and fears. And that the context of trouble in our life is it's a context which because of our weakness we easily get lost there. But Lord, as little children with our needs and our weakness, we appeal to You. Teach us, Lord, to see You. Teach us, Lord, to be able to worship and to hold on to the truth about You no matter what is happening to us. And Lord, bring us that experience of repose. Bring it to us, Lord. We need it. There's many here, Lord, who need that experience. Grant it to us and teach us these steps that we might gain strength in You. In Jesus' name, amen.